All right, why don't you go ahead and turn to Mark 15. The title of the message is Glorifying God in a Hostile World. We're going to look at about four points here as we go through. And why don't I start off by reading it and then we can, we can touch on it. So it says here in verse 1, Early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation. And binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, it is as you say. The chief priest began to accuse him harshly. Then Pilate questioned him again saying, do you not answer? See how many charges they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. The man named Barabbas had been in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the insurrection. The crowd went up and began asking him to do as he had been accustomed to do for for them. Pilate answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he was aware that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Answering again, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with him who you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, Crucify him. But Pilate Pilate said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him, wishing to satisfy the crowd Pilate released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Glorify God in a hostile world. We got to experience a little bit of that this week as we were out evangelizing in the streets of Tampa and the different neighborhoods, the trailer park homes, the neighborhoods uh, all across uh, the suburbs of Tampa. And we got to experience all sorts of responses this week. And so I thought it'd be helpful as we look through this passage as I was studying, it seemed that there there are three or four things that popped out that would be helpful for us um, in evangelism. As we begin to, we do uh, Monday evangelism, it's a whole church evangelism. You guys are more than welcome to come out to that on Monday night. Stay tuned to details on that and go to our website. But but also we have campus evangelism that happens throughout the week um, on campus and Uh, You can go and join uh, one of the college students there and and go share the gospel. And of course, people are doing that regularly, like just on their own, you know, with with their mail carrier or at the grocery store or wherever they go. And we encourage that. But every time I'm out with people, it just seems as if when we're rejected, and we'll get into some stories here in a moment, that people are shocked at the response of the hostility. They're wondering how in the world, I mean, how can we keep going? I mean, they're just downtrodden. I mean, their, their head sinks their, uh, to the floor and, and just don't know what to do. They, they don't even know if they want to go to the next door as we're going door to door, even in Tampa. And so as we look at this, I think there are some very practical things that might help us in evangelism. The first one, if you're looking at the first three verses, is one, you can trust the word of God. It already said that this would happen. John 15 says they'll hate you. Jesus said that just as they hated me, they'll hate you. And then there's multiple passages that speak about that. Second Peter 3, it says that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking in their own lusts. There's going to be people scoffing at you, making fun of you, yelling at you to leave. Saying that this is not the word of God, that this is not true. This is a fairy tale. What are you going to do about it? You're going to quit? You're going to hang up your Bible? You're going to persevere? There's a lot of truths in here that we can glean from. The religious leaders began to hurl insults, as it says here in the first three verses, that you see, like, at at 1 a.m., he was before uh, Caiaphas and Annas. Then at 3 a.m., Peter's denial uh, we were touching on that last week. Eric touched on that. And then 5 a.m., uh, he is now before the Sanhedrin. Now, they had to do this all. If you remember, this is an unfair trial. That was the purpose of two weeks ago's message, showing you how unfair it was. 
And you see that they had to get before the Sanhedrin before daybreak because uh, they know that if, if he ha even had a fair trial, which is only should be done during the day, this thing would be, you know, turned around in Jesus' favor, most likely if it was done fairly. But of course, we know it wasn't. And it was done unfairly as a part of God's plan to bring him to the cross. And so when you see, it, the first thing you should notice when you're out on the streets, when you're in Rome or you're in Orlando for the rest of the, the month, uh, weeks prior to going, you should know and expect, actually expect more ridicule, more hostility than maybe you already experience. You should expect that. It's coming. When it comes, you're like, oh, of course. Yes, this is exactly how our Lord told us it would be. Now, will there be salvations? Will God work on people's hearts? Of course he will. But every time we see hostility in the news, every time we see hostility on the streets, this is reaffirming something in our heart that the word of God is true. In fact, in Genesis 49, we don't have to turn there, but maybe even later, verses eight through 10, it talks about the fact that it, it, even in the last, half, last part of Genesis, they're about to go into bondage. Israel is about to go into bondage because of their sin. And so from then, from Egypt to Babylon, the Babylon to Syria, to uh, the Greeks, to the, then the Romans, and then even now the Palestinians, I mean, there's always conflict with Israel, isn't there? There's always been conflict with Israel. There's, they've always been ruled by a foreign by a foreign land, by a foreign enemy. And in fact, that even is in and of itself uh, shows that the word of God is true. That every time we see that the, the, the mistreatment of Christians, we're thinking, that's horrible. And it, and it is. We don't, we, I mean, we're not to uh, be excited about that, but it, the Bible is clear that we are to rejoice in the fact that we are being persecuted. And that when others are being persecuted, that reinforces that the word of God said that that was going to happen for years. Years and years ago said that that was going to happen. So we are, we are literally, you might say, man, I haven't really experienced the word of God very much. Every time you're on the streets and you're sharing the gospel, you're experiencing the word of God come alive. That should encourage your heart. In fact, in Philemon, it says that it, it, when we share, it encourages us because we're rehearsing the gospel. And we're also experiencing what it's like to be persecuted. <clears throat> Excuse me. So verses four and five says this. This is the second point. So one, that you can trust the word. And then second, you respond humbly when falsely accused or when ridiculed or persecuted. And it says here, then verses three or four and five, then when Pilate questioned him again saying, do you not answer? He was shocked. People cower in fear. You can almost imagine him going back, you know, to his wife and his wife said, hey, how did it go today? This is just the strangest thing. That this Jesus of Nazareth would not say anything to me. People are freaking out every time I talk to them. They're begging, please have mercy on me, Pilate. Have mercy on me, Pilate. And this man says nothing. Nothing. He's shocked. People should be shocked at you. When people yell at you and you don't respond the same way. When they're, when they're making fun of you, and it only will get worse. And the reason why I titled the message Glorifying God in a Hostile World is because it's only gonna get more hostile. And the more hostile it gets, and the better, the better we respond, the more we respond biblically, the more glory goes to God. People are just like, I'm baffled. I don't understand that. People cut me off in, in, on the highway, and they, they, they think the world's ending. And, and they're coming after your religion, so to speak. They're coming after everything that's precious about you, and you don't say anything. Why? That's amazing. Because Jesus in that moment knew exactly what he was going to do for people. He knew exactly what he was doing for all humanity. He knew for months on end, as we look back at Mark, saying he predicted many times that he would be mocked and ridiculed and then beaten and then put to death and then raised three days later. Pilate was agnostic. How many agnostics have you met during this week, even in Awakened? Many. He denied the reality of truth. He questioned truth. In fact, we can find that if you go ahead and turn to John 18, we see the trial a little bit more focused, a little bit more detail. 
Verse 28, actually we can move a little bit further than that. We can, in verse 29, Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him over to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, We were not permitted to put anyone to death. See, they were using Pilate in this. It was the hostility of the Jews that wanted him dead because it even says here, you know, Pilate's a pretty shrewd guy. He, he, knew, they, he knew that they were doing this out of envy, out of jealousy, because they hated him because no longer were they in charge of their area of, of, of religion. Of, of, they, they didn't have the sole word on God. It was God himself in the flesh that has, he is the word of God. He is the perfect teacher and he marveled everyone who heard him speak and that made them envious. So they needed to use Rome, make up some trumped up thing. Well, and say Jesus is a great threat to Rome. Pilate knew he wasn't a great threat to Rome. What does it say? So they needed, they needed Rome to put them, put him to death legitimately. And he, they knew that if there was a riot, because there would have been a riot, people love Jesus. They knew that he was something amazing, maybe not God, maybe they didn't want to submit to him, but they knew he was something amazing, something different, something uh, extraordinary. But they would have had a riot, but in order to avoid that, they needed Rome, the Jews needed Rome to blame, because if there's anything that came after that, Rome would be the blame and they would, they would obviously uh, be okay. But this is here in verse 31. So Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said, we are not permitted to put him in death. 32, to fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying what kind of death he was about to die. And then verse 33, therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. He's no threat to Rome. He's no threat, political threat. He came not to bring political freedom, but spiritual freedom. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so are you a king? Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king, but not a king of this world, of course, for this I have been born. And for this, I come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And then Pilate says this, good agnostic. What is truth? I mean, he knew something was going on here. He knew something was different about this man. Something was different. And Jesus remained silent. That was what Pilate was most amazed of. And this, but of course, this was a prophecy, right? Isaiah 53, 7 says this, the Jews should have known this. They said, oh, wait, something's going on here. He's saying he's the son of God. He's come to save the world through his death. This looks a lot like Isaiah 53 that was prophesied. And instead they were ignorant. The word of God was right before them. How often does this happen even on the streets? How often does this happen to the people that you talk to? They're so hardened. They love their sin so much that they totally miss what the Bible says about Jesus. The clear truth that he is who he says he is. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter and like a sheep that was silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus fulfilling prophecy right before Pilate. Right before the Jewish people and even right before our eyes. This is exactly who he says he is. We can trust the word of God and we can, we too can be like Christ and humbly respond to false, false accusations. You know, it's interesting. This is, what, this is a really good, I guess, advice by Jesus when we're on the streets or we're talking to people like our family at the dinner table, you know, for uh, for when we go home for break or Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever, summer break. But anyone who truly wanted information, 
who asks, why do you believe this? Or asks about the word of God, asks about Jesus. Jesus always responded. We get that from Mark 14, 62, right? He says, he says are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? This is further uh, back into his trial in the early morning. He says, I am. He says, I am. And you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power coming with the cl- on the clouds of heaven. You need to answer people that ask why you believe a certain thing. You need to be ready. 1 Peter 3.15 is clear. We need to do it with gentleness and respect. You can't be tongue-tied at that moment. You need, to, you need to answer. It's important that we are ready, and we're ready, guys, with our lives, not memorizing a track. We're ready with our lives because as we read the Bible, this whole Bible is a track. This whole Bible and our lives together is a witness for Christ. It's an answer for people wondering what in the world, do you, why do you believe that? Why do you believe in fairy tales? Well, let me tell you, I don't believe in fairy tales. And I'll show you why this is true. Let me take you to Isaiah 53. Let me take you then to Mark chapter 15 and John 18 and show you by just this small little tiny passage in the Bible why, how God's word is true, let alone every other. Pa- I mean, there's 1,189 chapters in the Bible. I just gave you three. You don't need to memorize a track. You need to read your Bible. I need to live out the scriptures. It is so important that we do that. All of us are evangelists. All of us. There are some that are able to, uh, like the work of evangelism in Ephesians 4, where it says that they equip more evangelists. They equip the church to do evangelism, and, and we do that, right? But everyone here, including myself, we're all evangelists. We all represent Christ, and we all need to give a reason if someone asks us. If someone's teeing it up, I mean, it's just, you know, some of those evangelism encounters, which I'll get into in a moment here, they're just, it's like, oh my goodness, if I miss this, I might not be saved, right? I mean, you know, but it's so easy. God is just working all those things together. And sometimes you think, I was just a a babbling fool. I just couldn't get anything out of my mouth and I just, I tried hard and they're, they're receiving and I don't even know how that works because it's the spirit of God that works. You don't have to be a professional evangelist. You don't have to sound like Billy Graham. You don't even, don't do that. Just be yourself. But here's the thing that you, that you need. You need to read the word of God and you need to live it out. And you have those two things. You'll be a great evangelist. Might be losing my voice, probably too much speaking this week. <laughs> I just realize that now. Um, so, uh, but secondly, uh, on that, so if, he, if people want information and they have a heart to receive it, he answered. However, when people accused him and they were hostile and they were yelling and you can tell they're not welcomed, what did Jesus do? He didn't give them one, one thing. Not one word did he speak. Man, if we would be more like him in evangelism, just think of the fruit. Just think of the encouragement. It says this in 1 Peter 2, 20 and 21, and we must suffer patiently. I think there's no greater witness than to suffer patiently for Christ. If when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, and this finds favor with God. Don't we all want favor with God? Don't we all want to know that we please him? This is what pleases him. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you in what? An example, an imprint. He leaves a mark on you. Christ goes before us. It says that in Hebrews 12. He's our author and perfecter. He's our, he, he, he's our uh, example. He's, he's our pioneer, as it says in that passage. He's the one who goes before us. That means if he, whatever was going on, whatever he did is gonna, and, and experience, we would experience besides the death and resurrection, but although we would experience that too in a spiritual sense. In Hebrews, it says this, Hebrews 12, three, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, every time you're rejected on the streets, every time you knock on the door and someone's like, get off my property or whatever, 
You could just say, you know what, Hebrews, Hebrews 12.3. This isn't as bad. Me experiencing this is not nowhere near as bad as what Christ experienced. Did you have a crown of thorns on your head? Did you get stripped naked before men and then put on, they put on a royal robe, a purple robe on you and then beat you with a stick? Did they pluck out your beard? Did they spit on your face? Did they nail you to a cross? No, none of those things. But he's our example, great example. Oh, if only we could experience even somewhat the hostility that he did and endure it well. It bring great favor of the Lord upon this church, upon us. J.C. Ryle says this, great is the contrast between the second Adam and the first. The first Adam, this is our guy in Genesis 1, right? This is our great, 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 great grandpa somehow. First Adam was guilty and yet tried to what? Excuse and defend himself. But you see, the second Adam was guiltless and yet he made no defense at all. This is who Christ is. And when we were in Tampa, there was a man, uh, we, we had gone to this trailer park and we were walking around. There was, there was like no sidewalks, no walks up to their house. So you couldn't tell if there was the back of their home or the front and they each had a door on each side and we just, we didn't know what we were knocking on. And so we knocked on the door uh, of, of one, no answer. And then we, we skirted around another one, uh, another trailer and it was, it was an open door and this man was laying on the couch. He saw me because I'm walking around and I'm like, I'm totally, this is so awkward because I'm like, this guy's probably watching TV or something and I'm like about to go up to this man's house. He gets up and he starts yelling at me by the top of his lungs, get out, if you're a church, get out, get out, if you're a church, get out. And then not only that, but then there's a guy, uh, a group after us and I was thinking, I was actually probably like, Lord, please don't let any one of our groups go there because he is, I mean, the shotgun could come out at that point, you know, like I was just like, please Lord, let that. And so, then he says this, he takes it up a notch. He's like, if you, if, get out of here if you're at church, whatever, unless you have drugs, sex, or alcohol, get out of here. I mean, this man was hostile, right? I mean, we can all agree he's hostile, right? Okay, does that ever happen to you? No? Not on campus? Not, not, in, the, not in your nice Oviedo neighborhoods? No? Okay. <laughs> it was good for the soul. <laughs> it really was. It was good for the soul. But you know, as I was, um, as we were down at Nicole's family's house, I was, you know, talking about our evangelism experiences and, and then uh, just how we got yelled at because he was asking, you know, like people, are you received? Are you well received? And he's like, oh, I'll never remember. Oh, I'll never forget this. When I was in New Orleans, we were, we were there for, her, her uncle was saying this, 80-year-old uncle. He's like, I remember when I was in New Orleans and this man was standing um, in this New Orleans parade and he was standing with a cross and he was just talking to people about Jesus and they were like spitting at him and yelling at him and he's like, man, I would lose my religion if that happened to me. I was like, that is our religion. You see, that is our religion. We don't, res we don't, we don't respond back to that. We take it. We don't lose our faith because people ridicule us. In fact, it strengthens. It strengthens because we get to see that the word of God is true. It's powerful. It's living and active. It's alive today as it was 2,000 years ago and it will be alive today as it will be then 1,000 years from now. In fact, eternity from now. Not a word will be gone from the word of God. Not a word will perish. The grass may fade, but not a word will fade from the scriptures. Matthew 5, how hard is this? 12 and 13. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of things evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is in heaven. It is great for in the same way they persecute the prophets who are before you. Guys, we're just in a long line of people being persecuted because of Christ. We have a lot of heroes that have gone before us. 
that have been persecuted. This is, it should never shock us. And I remember just even walking, I, I can't tell you how many evangelism encounters I've been on when someone just is so rude, so hostile, maybe just yells at you or, or just is, maybe in a kind way wants us out of their way. But how people get so discouraged and they're like, man, what do we do now? Like, and I'm not, they're not, they never say like, let's just go home. But they're just so like, they're so distraught. That it's like they, they don't even, they don't even know that this is, exists in the Bible. This is what God has called us to. We should never be surprised. And the world's only going to get worse from here on out. What does the Bible say in Matthew 7? What, is, what does Jesus say in Matthew 7? Do a lot of people find him? Does the whole world find him? Are people just giddy to get up in the morning to, to can't wait to hear an evangelist speak to them? People knocking on our door, people calling, Jessica, are people calling like, you know, five times a day just needing to hear the word? The only time people call us is if they're asking sometimes for money. They don't want Jesus. What does the word say? Verse 13, enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to what? Destruction. Most people are on it. And there are many who enter through it. Many. Many. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. You could, you could pretty much bet if you drive around Oviedo and you go around some Florida neighborhood, just typical cookie cutter Florida neighborhood, right? Just drive around that thing and look and you could almost bet that probably about less than 10% of the people in that neighborhood know the Lord. Truly saved. Why is it you think that we come into this place and worship God and sing songs to him? Because it's a miracle that we're even sitting here. We even have a level of joy in our hearts to worship God. He's put it there by his spirit, which is a miracle. So thankful for what the Lord has done in our life and many lives and in those who he is going to save in the city and around the world. But don't be shocked. Did you notice that it's not, I didn't say that we are to be, that let this passage be an excuse to be cynical. No, I'm excited every time I go out. I'm excited. Why? Because I'm believing that God is going to do his work, and he does. And you know what the enemy will do is he will, he will discourage you. He might say, well, yeah. You know, he'll discourage you like you want to go home after someone yells at you. But it'll, but it'll also blind you from the fact that, it, it, from the word that Jesus is mighty to save, he's mighty to save, meaning he's, he's able to save. His arm is not too short to save. It'll discourage you to the point where maybe perhaps you don't even want to go to the next door. And, and that's the door where there'll be a positive response. And guess what happened? It was. After that guy yelled at me, we go to the next door and we all just take a big deep breath. We're like, here we go. <laughs> and this woman was so hungry for the Lord. It's probably the only hungry person we saw all, all, all week in Tampa is my understanding when we're sharing testimonies. But it's amazing what goes before that, doesn't it? Because, you know, in a, little, in, in a way, if I'm honest, it, it did discourage me even though I knew that this is what the word of God says. I mean, just my flesh was like, man, are, are we gonna get kicked out of here or what's the next level here? Because we were kicked out of many places. We were kicked out of the mall. We were kicked out of different places in, in Tampa. It was, it was a security guards kicked us out. I mean, it's getting more hostile, guys. It's getting harder and harder and harder. But this woman uh, was, was open. You know, and the thing is, if we weren't ready, we could have been like, I, I, I don't, but, the, the, like, uh, <laughs> it's just, could you ever feel like that in evangelism in a way? I mean, we all kind of do. But sometimes, like, when the woman, when, when she's just like, okay, so what's the gospel, you know? It's like, well, let me talk to my colleagues first, you know? 
<laughs> We've been doing this for a long time. It's like the awkward sales guy who just got hired last week and doesn't even know the product they're selling. Like, let me just consult with my iPhone here. I just need to figure out what the specs on this thing. Uh, it'll be an amazing product. I'm, I'm not sure how it works, but... Uh, no, we know how this thing works. This is our product guide. This is our manual. And we need to know it. It's important that we do. Brought her right to John 3, because it's just classic, classic street evangelism encounter. I mean, just, you want to know what a classic one is? You want to know? It's just, all it is is this. They don't have some fancy religion that they're aspiring to. They're not, they're just, hey, good will outweigh the bad. And I think I'm a fairly good person. And I know a lot about, you know, things about the Bible, you know, Jesus and God and, you know, things of that nature. I know there's a heaven or hell. But as soon as one says, I'm saved by my works, I'm saved, my good will outweigh the bad, bring them to Romans. And I just got to explain, look, you know, Romans 1 through 3, it just, it shows the depravity of man. None of us are good. Not even one. No one's righteous. And, and the wages of sin is death. I mean, I, I took out, I had a few tracks. And I said, look, because of the way you live your life, when you die, I'll take out like a bunch of money and I'm just, I'm paying you. It's wages, right? I, I, you earned an eight, eight hour a day. The boss paid you. The wages of your eight hour a day is $300. Well, the wages of your whole life from birth to death is death. That's the wages. You earn that. It's your fault. It's your deal. You can't blame God. You can't blame your mom. You can't blame your circumstances. You blame yourself. Romans 1 through 3 is clear. We're done. We're screwed. It's over. Game over. We're done. But, but God, rich in mercy, while you were still sinners, he died for you. You didn't do jack. And so Romans 3, part of 3, 4, 5, and 6, it shows just the beauty of salvation. That, you were, that just as Christ died, you died with him. And just as Christ rose from the dead, you rose in the same spirit in which dwells in you. Or dwells in the, and Jesus dwells in you. You have power now to live out a life. Romans 7, they ask, there's the battle between you know, the, the flesh and, and the spirit and all that. And then, and then Romans 8, it shows the promise that he's going to glorify you to the very end. You're going to persevere to the end. You have nothing to worry about. Then he gets into this little theological thing, which we're going to pause on. We're not going to go there in the evangelism encounter from 9, 9 through 10. It's 9, 10, 11, right? About how God's going to save the Jews and election. You know, now, now you're into 12. And it's the practicals. This is how we should live our life. Maybe you want to ask, hey, has your life changed in the last two or three years? Have you noticed a change? Well, no, not really much change. Well, maybe perhaps because you're not born again. Then you take them, what's born again? I don't even know what that means. Okay, let's go back. To, let's go to John chapter 3. Let's talk about being born again. Are you born again? Did you have anything to do with your first birth? You say like, mom, hey, I think I want to come out today. No, you had nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. Then you have nothing to do with your second birth. God does it all. And I'll tell you what, that's a terrifying thought to an unsaved person. You mean to tell me I have nothing to do with this? Nope. No, ma'am. Nothing. So what do I need to do? You probably need to go on your knees tonight when we leave and beg God to, to give you a new heart. Because Ezekiel 36 is very clear. No one goes to heaven without a new heart. I don't know what happened to that woman. I'm hoping that she gets followed up. She said she wants to get followed up. She really wants to go. She's like, oh, you at that church over there on, the, over there on that street? Main Street 301? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've just come here to evangelize and help this church out and We'll be gone next week, but they'll be here to follow up. And I'm praying that the same kind of follow-up that happened with some of the same, the same people that you know, are here with us today because they were followed up by a team from Texas 10 years ago. They are now with us. They even perhaps, that woman, I think her name is Amber, if I remember. She will be in, not only in heaven, but be a part of that church and then she will knock on doors. And maybe perhaps she'll even be, you know, b building up Bible studies in her little, little trailer park home. And Mad, M Mad Max, whatever his name is, would, would, you know, would be saved. And, you know, say, and he'd be born again. And he'd be doing communion services or whatever, you know, instead of yelling at people to get off their property. But, 
Or maybe he'll be casting out demons. He'll be letting, like, the, ah, <laughs> takes one to know one. And then he just, you know, goes and, and uh, whatever. So praise the Lord. You know, hey, look, you never know how God will transform people's lives. But what we did there glorified him. It glorified the Lord. It was powerful. All right. And number three, we need to press people to respond in the moment because there is no neutral ground. There's no neutral ground. You see, Pilate then sent Jesus to Herod. And if you remember the story in Mark 6, we did that months and months ago. We, it said, you know, Herod well, illegally divorced his wife and then took his half-brother, uh, uh, half-brother's wife named Philip uh, and, and John the Baptist uh, was killed because he spoke out against this sexual morality. And then when Herod heard about Jesus, he freaked out and said, hey, I want to meet Jesus. But it wasn't a genuine, hey, I want to meet him because he wanted to meet him perhaps to kill him because he thought it was John the Baptist being, you know, rising from the dead. He's like, oh no, he's after me. He's going to make my life a living hell. Literally, we got to eliminate this guy. And then finally, at the end of his life in Luke 23, 8 through 12, you can read that later. But Herod was what? Was he impressed by Jesus? When he finally got to meet this guy, was he impressed? I mean, his heart was beating fast. His fear was, tre- he was trembling. He's like, I'm before this man. He might be John the Baptist. He's going to speak out against me again, make my life miserable. And then realizing this wasn't John, what did he do? He went back to his old ways. He started mocking him. This is exactly what people do. People have those moments, right, during COVID. People go to church, right? They, they, they flock to church. Every time there's a crisis that are having, and it's a good moment. It's a good opportunity to share the gospel. But how many of those people are still in church today? How many of those people are still in church since 9-11? Remember 9-11, all those people going to church? I remember hearing aunts and uncles and people like, oh man, I, I'm interested in God. And I mean, God uses that, whatever. And then th- there's fear, right? There's fear. And then they go back to their old way and they're mocking Christ. And they're even, at least in their own heart right? It's exactly what they're doing because they're not genuinely saved. You cannot be neutral here, guys. No one can be neutral. And it's on record why it's foolish to be neutral. In the annals of history, Pilate and Herod are there as neutral men. Neutral men. Now, they didn't take out a sword and chop Jesus' head off, right? They didn't do anything wrong. They weren't, they weren't directly involved in that. I mean, they're not hostile in a sense that they're yelling at you. But you know those people that are real quiet and very polite? Oh, no, thank you, sir. They're going to hell just as much as the hostile guy. Don't be fooled. There is no neutral ground here. No one is going to heaven neutral. See, there were three major conflicts. He was, then he went from Herod, then he's back to Pilate. So Pilate, Herod, Pilate. And this is the second phase or the Gentile phase of Jesus' unfair trial. So back to Pilate. He, Pilate needed to be very careful. He did not want to offend the Jews so, and be removed by Rome. And there were many, many, many conflicts that were happening. This is what happens with political leaders that are all about themselves. This is why it's very hard for a rich man to get into heaven. As you could see in the life of Pilate, and then the life of our president and the life of our congressmen and, and congresswomen, there's it, the, that kind of power, it does not break a man or a woman to Christ. And so look at this. I mean, Pilate, uh, eventually, during one of his conflicts, he had placed gold covering shields to honor Tiberius Caesar in Herod's palace in Jerusalem. But see, the Jews were offended you know, this, seeing that these shields were idolatrous because it's in the palace. And, 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 um, and then uh, Pilate uh, was asked to remove them and he, was, he stubbornly refused. So what did they do? They brought a Jewish delegation to Rome. They went before Caesar. They said, look, this guy, you're not listening to us. This is how politics work. Okay, no problem. We'll go, we'll remove the shields. Pilate, if you do that one more time, you'll lose your job. You see how politics work? Happens all the time, doesn't it? May even happen in your own, your own workplace. Look, the odds of you being fired because you mentioned the name Jesus is very slim. But they'll find something else on you to fire you. That's how politics work. You're not gonna be fired because you'd be dancing coming out of whatever place you're 
employed with. That's exciting. I've said this for a long time now, right? I mean, we've said this for many months. You're not gonna be fired because you mentioned Jesus. You could probably bring a lawsuit for that. You see, businesses are way too smart. They don't want a lawsuit. They gotta just find another way to get you out of there. And they'll find a legal way to do that. So you gotta watch your back. You gotta, I mean, you gotta trust Christ that you're, you're there in that workplace for the time that you're there for. But I would imagine over the years, we'll see it becoming more hostile and people losing their jobs. But at the same time, Matthew 6 is true. God will take care of you. He'll take care of you. And so it says, John 19, 12, Jews threatened Pilate, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Pilate was about to do it. He was like, look, I'm gonna release this guy. My wife has a dream, Matthew 27. This is kind of weird. I mean, he's talking to his wife, right? He's like, look, this guy's silent. This is weird. They usually cower in fear. And she's like, you know what? I, I, I meant to tell you this, but I had a dream about this man. We need to be really careful of him. Something's very strange about this man, and I was suffering in the night. And I would be careful that you don't suffer as well because of this. Don't do this. And he's thinking, I don't know what else to do. These Jews are on my back, and I don't know what to do. And so I, I, I might get fired from, from Rome eventually, he continued to mess up. Pilate continued to mess up. He eventually was called back to Rome on another incident, and then he committed suicide, as history says. Very sad ending to this man's life. He was so full with rage and so full with uh, malice and, and murder, but yet at the same time so flimsy and so cowardly. This is our leadership even today in many places. So as a man pleaser, Pilate had Jesus flogged. He figured, hey, we'll beat this guy, mess him up a little bit, and then release him. And so then came Barabbas. They said, look, um, uh, Pilate was hoping that they would obviously pick Jesus to be <laughs> released. And so by that time, they had him flogged because he was going to then go and be crucified because to weaken the body. So it's kind of preparation for him to die quicker. And then... Uh, then, you know, Rome had one merciful day <laughs> and it was to release the prisoner. And he was a robber and a murderer, an insurrectionist. And Pilate was just banking on the fact that the Jews would have some level of mercy like Rome would and pick Jesus. Of course, that didn't happen. And then uh, just shocked at everyone saying, crucify him, crucify him. And the crowd wins the day in this battle and then Jesus was silent all the way through because he knew the Lord God, Yahweh's plan for his life, which was to die for all of our sin here. The last thing I want to say here as we close is from verses 6 to 15, but it's from this passage, uh, when we're in evangelism, we need to remember our own salvation. We need to press people because there's no neutral ground. We need to respond humbly because people are watching. We need to know that the word of God is true even in hostility. But lastly here, we need to remember our own salvation. Pilate asks, he's like, then what should I do with the king of the Jews? What should I do with this man? You see, isn't it interesting that John 18 verse 40, there's one little phrase there that it's important that many of us would overlook it says in the other synoptic gospels that he was a murderer, he was an insurrectionist, but what else was he? A robber. Who was between Jesus on the cross, crosses, to what? Robbers. Two robbers. Instead of Barabbas dying that death as a robber as he should have, the guilty. Jesus, the innocent, who robbed no one, who told everyone to pay their taxes, did not want to be a king of the Jews in that political sense. He was no threat to Rome, no threat to any human being, only the religious. He took his place on the cross. Guilty for the innocent. Innocent for the guilty, he substituted is what he does in our life. 1 Peter 3, 18, Christ died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, 
so that he might bring us to God, having put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. This is the great substitution, the 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin, he who knew no sin took the place of someone like Barabbas and someone like us, we're all Barabbas. Every single one of us is Barabbas. We find ourselves in this story over and over again, don't we? The only one that just said, you know what, this is, this is crazy. This, is, this, this story is nuts. I, I, don't, I, I can't find myself anywhere in this story. This doesn't make any sense to me. Only one who is broken over their own sin would realize, man, I need to get up on that cross. I'm the robber, murderer, insurrectionist. I'm the prideful one. I'm the one who commits adultery at heart, who envies, who's jealous, who's greedy, who's merciless. But yet it was Christ. Listen to what Ryle says. The guilty is set free and the innocent is put to death. The great sinner is delivered and the sinless one remains bound. Barabbas is spared, Christ is crucified. God pardons and justifies the ungodly. He does it because Christ has suffered in their stead. The just for the unjust, they deserve punishment, but the mighty substitute has suffered for them. They deserve eternal death, but a glorious surety has died for them. We are all by nature in the position of Barabbas. Every single one of us, we are guilty, wicked, worthy of condemnation. But when we are without hope, Christ, the innocent, has died for the ungodly. And now God, for Christ's sake, can be just and yet the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Let us bless God. That is the response of us right now. That that is what we're to do even in a moment here as we sing, that we have such a glorious salvation set before us. Our plea must must ever be, not that we are deserving of acquittal, but that Christ has died for us. Let us take heed that having so great a salvation, we really make use of it for our own souls. May we never rest until we can say by faith, Christ is mine. I deserve hell, but Christ has died for me. And believing in him, I now have the hope of heaven. You know, I wonder what Barabbas did. Did he walk and follow Christ for the rest of the way saying, man, that could have been me. That could have been me. That could have been me. Have you ever just gotten, maybe just, just think over the last week, over the last few years, that you've received such mercy, you were shocked, blown away, thankful. Oh, Lord, your mercy is so much more. And as he walked and he was like, I, I'm sure in one sense, Barabbas was like, this is too good to be true because I woke up as a prisoner on death row and now I get to sleep in my nice comfy bed tonight as a free man. Isn't that all of us here? We're on our way to hell, but Jesus in his mercy, someone knocked on the door of our heart, maybe even physically in our door, and said, this Jesus has died for you. You are now saying then your testimony is I was once lost and now I'm fine, found and I was blind, <laughs> but now I see, I don't know. <laughs> it's been a long week, guys. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> but I wonder as he went all the way to the cross, then in one sense, he's like, man, I don't know, this is too good to be true. Maybe I'll get arrested. So he's like, maybe he's hiding, watching. And as this man dies on the cross, maybe these two other men who are guilty as Barabbas, just as guilty, and you're looking, and this is what evangelism is like, isn't it? We're watching Christ and what he's done for us in the middle of the cross and what he's done for us, he's given us such grace and he's given us this purpose, this mission to go and share the gospel. Then those other two dudes on the left and the right of Christ, we're looking at them as we look at people on the street saying, that could have been me and that should be me. That could have been me. Man, I, like every time I knock on the door and somebody just rejects me and says, that could be me. I could be slamming the door on Christ as that man did on the cross and said, look at this fool. And the other man had the, had the decency, the, I mean, he just had the, the spirit of God come on him and said, this man has done no wrong. As Barabbas is finally connecting with the other robber saying, it's right, he has done no wrong. I should be up there. That's the gospel, the great substitution. 
He replaces us on the cross. We should be there. And it's a great reminder for us as we do evangelism. As this world gets more and more hostile, why, God? Why have you saved me? And the only answer to that is what? Because God is gracious and merciful and long-suffering. You see how evangelism ultimately humbles us? It doesn't make us more prideful because you know more. How foolish. Hopefully this is etched in your mind. This is a great evangelism passage in that sense where you get to see in your mind all these players. And really, we get to play Barabbas every day of our life. That he's been merciful to us. We should have died a horrific death and then been thrown into hell for all of eternity. But instead, Jesus had mercy on all of us and that we might live with him forever. And he might humble us for the rest of our life, encouraging one another what he's done. So Father, thank you so much for giving us this incredible picture once again of the gospel. Lord, we cannot be neutral. We cannot be like those jokers on the, on the cross just ridiculing Jesus and one realize I cannot die in the state I am because Jesus is truly innocent. And we only hope that Barabbas had seen that and, and eventually was saved as well. Lord, we pray that we would be humbled again and again by the fact that none of us deserve to be here. None of us deserve to even be in the seat we're sitting in to hear this in incredible truth week after week, singing these beautiful songs, being friends with people that are like-minded. So much to be thankful for. Lord, let us not be neutral. If there's anyone neutral here, Lord, I pray that you'd open up their eyes of their heart. You'd exchange their heart of stone for a heart of flesh and that it might be molded towards you and receive the seed of the gospel and may it bear fruit. And Lord, we thank you for giving us this grace this week in Tampa. Lord, I pray that all those seeds that we sown, so many, I pray that even next year, perhaps if we get the opportunity to go back, Lord, that we would see the fruit of that work. The church would follow up, make disciples. And Lord, we pray that uh, in Rome, Lord, that we would go into Rome knowing your word and what it says about hostility, what it says about rejection, that we would not be discouraged by that. We would be encouraged that your word is coming true and that we would have great faith that you are mighty to save and that we would continue to persevere in this and watch you move. And Lord, I pray that disciples would be made there. Pray that your church would be filled with new conversion growth at Johnny's church. Pray, Lord, that it would spread across Italy. Lord, and that there'd be many, many opportunities across the map for us to go to and see your kingdom come, your will be done. And Lord, I pray that you protect us. Pray that all the money and finances would come in for this. Pray for, for your vision. Um, your word to lead us by your spirit. Lord, encourage us this morning. I pray that we would, we would see this beautiful picture over and over again in our minds that, that the innocent one, son of God, took our place on that cross. You didn't belong there. You didn't belong anywhere near that cross. That cross owned us. But yet you, being the lamb without blemish was hung on Passover so that we might be saved. And not only that, but you resurrected from the dead and you put that spirit inside of us to go and be your disciples, to be your witnesses in those four corners of the earth. And I pray that we be faithful until you return. In Christ's name, amen.